Um, so we are going to move on now to Garrett Stuber from the University of Washington. Garrett, whenever you're ready. All right, can you see my slides okay? Perfect. Thanks. Um, like to thank the organizers of this virtual conference. Um, it's a really great lineup of speakers and I think it speaks uh, incredibly highly about the future of the field. So thanks for the invite. Um, so today my talk is gonna be a little bit of a hodgepodge of a couple different things, but the focus is really gonna be on the molecular and functional definition of cell types within the uh, lateral habenula the lateral hypothalamic area and uh, their connections to the VTA. So, um, and um, I think this is gonna touch upon a lot of the themes we've already heard about um, in this session. So it's really great that um, um, to be here with the other speakers today. Um, so generally speaking, my lab's interested in the neural circuits of motivation and reward processing. And we've done a, a lot of work trying to delineate the cell types and their functions um, uh, within these areas with a, with a focus of the cells and their uh, circuits that tend to be upstream of the, the dopamine system. And so what I'm gonna tell you about today is some of our work looking at uh, cells in the lateral hypothalamic area, some of which project to the lateral habenula, some of which project to the VTA, as well as um, some, a recently published paper uh, from the lab focusing on the cell type composition in the, in the habenula directly. Okay, so um, before we get into that, I thought I would quickly um, just go over um, some of the anatomy and what's known about the habenula. So this is an epithalamic structure that probably um, most of you have uh, heard about and are familiar with, but um, it's divided into two different uh, regions, a medial region, the medial habenula, and the lateral region. Lateral region uh, projects heavily to the monoaminergic systems, including the VTA and the dorsal raphe and locus ceruleus. Um, the medial habenula uh, tends to be uh, completely separate from this and projects mainly to the endopeduncular nucleus. Um, what's really uh, exciting to me about the habenula complex is that it's very uh, well evolutionarily well conserved across species. So um, in, the, in the primate brain, the mouse brain, and even the zebrafish brain, uh, these structures can be identified in uh, many of the same cell types. Um, uh, reside across species, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute. And so what really uh, inspired work on the habenula in our lab, um, you know, back, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, um, was work that we heard about earlier in the session from Professor Hikasaka, where they showed that if you record electrophysiologically from habenula neurons um, in primates, you can see that they're excited by aversive stimuli and inhibited by um, rewarding stimuli. And this coupled with a lot of anatomical data that was coming out around the same time, uh, showing that these habenula neurons project um, uh, to the VTA and to the posterior segment, the RMTG, um, really piqued our interest in uh, studying their function further. And so um, Alice Damatakis, when she was a graduate student in my lab um, early on, did studies to do optogenetic stimulation of the um, habenula to VTA RMTG pathway. And I'm um, just gonna share one of these experiments, which we already heard about from Stephanie, which is the real-time place preference assay, um, where animals can freely choose to spend time on the side of a box where they receive simulation or not. So this is a control animal, shows real no uh, preference, but you can see when we stimulate the lateral habenula to VTA projections, um, this was highly aversive. The animals, uh, as soon as the stimulation came on, the animal turned around and left that side of the chamber and tended to spend most of the time on the uh, non-stimulation side of the chamber. So um, that's what's shown here. And around the same time that this paper came out, uh, Stefan Lamel, who we're gonna hear about uh, his work in a minute, um, published something very similar showing that, uh, sort of uh, confirming that this uh, pathway is highly aversive. And so, um, this, uh, uh, these studies were some of the first to really start to show the functional relevance of the connectivity between the habenula and the VTA, um, but it really opened up a lot of questions as well um, in terms of um, um, what are the different cell types in this region, um, and um, can we identify different types of habenula cells and uh, look um, more at some of their molecular diversity and composition in more detail. And so in that first study, we were just 
sort of non-specifically targeting all habenula neurons. And we didn't really have a good uh, way going forward to really look at uh, molecularly defined cell types in this region. And so um, a few years ago, uh, now we, we were able to start to look at this in a little bit more detail. And so this is data from a paper that we published last year in Neuron from uh, Yoshiko Hashikawa and Koichi Hashikawa in my lab, um, where we use single cell RNA sequencing to uh, delineate the different cell types in the habenula. And so um, what Koichi and Yoshiko did was to dissect out um, both the lateral and the medial habenula, uh, punch this out from mouse brains, and then we did um, 10x um, genomic single cell uh, transcriptional profiling using uh, version two, where we can barcode the uh, cDNAs that are, um, are uh, coming from the different uh, messenger RNA transcripts, uh, construct library sequence, and then do bioinformatics to uh, delineate all the different uh, cell types and their uh, transcriptional uh, markers. And so from this data set, we recovered about 11,800 single cell transcriptomes. Um, we saw about 2,000 or so unique molecular identifiers per cell. So this is uh, unique uh, transcript molecules per cell and on a median of about 1,000 unique genes per cell. And so um, what we can do is take this very high dimensional data and um, sort of do some dimensionality reduction and visual, visualization to show these uh, UMAP plots, which help us uh, visualize the different types of cells that we're seeing. So in addition to the neurons in the habenula, which you can see here and here, um, there's also a number of supporting cells and other cell types um, that might be of interest to people, microglia, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, et cetera. Um, and these all have unique markers associated with them. Um, but of course, what we were interested in is the, uh, the neurons in this region and whether we could discover uh, unique molecular markers to um, uh, delineate these cells. And so what we did is to take all the neurons that were defined by sort of pan uh, neuronal markers and uh, perform a second round of uh, clustering on these. And uh, what we were able to see is that um, uh, when we recluster just the neurons, we sort of see two large clusters emerge. Uh, one which we later went on to show is the medial habenula cell types and another which is the lateral habenula uh, cell types. And so if we sort of look at these in UMAP space and plot the expression of some different gene markers, such as SLC17A6 or VGLU2, you can see that um, this gene marks both of these clusters pretty reliably. However, the gene TAC2 or tachykinin, um, uh, I think this is the receptor 2, uh, marks uh, the medial habenula. And this other gene, PCDH10, is a reliable marker for uh, lateral habenula. And of course, uh, one of the things that's always good to do in these experiments is to uh, sort of cross-validate the data using fluorescent in situ hybridization methods. And so that's what we did here. And again, you can see that TAC2 is really nicely co-localized the medial habenula, PCDH10 is in uh, lateral. And so what this really allows us to do is to uh, really mine the data for interesting molecular features that we can follow up with, uh, with functional studies. And so this is just giving you one example of that where we've split out um, are six uh, medial habenula cell types and six lateral habenula cell types and plotted the expression of a bunch of genes that um, are coding various ion channel subunits um, or ion channel associated genes. And what you can see is that each of these has a, a, you know, many overlapping genes, but also some very unique ones that we can sort of prioritize for uh, future study. Uh, we can also look at the uh, transcription factor networks that are associated with gene expression, and we showed that these are very different if we're looking at the uh, transcription factors associated with medial habenula cells versus those associated with uh, lateral habenula cells. Um, a few years before this paper came out, um, there was a, a really uh, beautiful paper published in Current Biology by Pandy et al., um, where they did single cell transcriptional profiling of the zebrafish habenula. And we thought this was a really uh, good opportunity for us to compare our uh, mouse data with uh, their fish data. And so what we did for this analysis was basically to download their data, um, mash it up with our data, and then perform um, a, a round of clustering uh, to look at the sort of uh, convergence and uh, alignment. So after correcting for um, sort of differences in the sequencing depth and uh, things like that, cell type number, uh, what we were able to find was that um, transcriptionally, there's a lot of similarity between 
the mouse uh, medial habenula to the dorsal habenula in the fish and the lateral habenula in the mouse to the ventral habenula in the fish. Um, and we saw that many of these same markers are very well conserved across these two uh, different species, um, which is uh, really interesting to us. Um, in addition to that, we sort of took those markers that we discovered that marked all the different uh, habenula cell types, um, both lateral and medial, and uh, wanted to see whether th there was any spatial distribution to these. Did it, was it that uh, some of the cell types were enriched in one particular portion of the lateral habenula, or were they more sprinkled out in a more random fashion? And so to do this, we used um, um, Hyplex and C2 hybridization, where we could probe, um, you know, typically nine or 12 or more genes. In this case, I'm just showing a, a subset of these. And so these were genes that we identified as markers of medial habenula cell types over here and lateral habenula cell types over here. And um, the sort of take home message was that it was a bit of both. There was certain genes such as uh, CCK in um, the medial habenula that was really enriched in a very uh, particular subdomain of that. Um, whereas there was other genes um, such as uh, FAM101B or GPR151 that tended to be sprinkled out throughout the structure. So um, the bottom line is that we can use a sort of combination of um, either in situ hybridization or spatial transcriptomics with single cell RNA sequencing to really um, understand the anatomy of these uh, different cell types. Oh, and this is just showing that there is a sort of uh, convergence between the uh, in situ data and the single cell sequencing data. Um, okay, how are we doing on time? Good, okay, so in the last uh, nine minutes or so, I'm gonna move on since this was published last year and there's um, lots of other analyses you can look at in the paper. Um, but I thought I'd present something a, a little uh, newer and unpublished. And so this was some work uh, looking at the projections from the lateral hypothalamic area, which sends uh, robust projections both to the lateral habenula and to the ventral tegmental area. And so, and this is the pathway we just heard about from uh, Stephanie in the last talk. And this was work that was done by uh, Mark Rossi, who was a postdoc in the lab up until about two weeks ago. Uh, Mark is now starting his own lab at Rutgers University in July, and he is actively looking for students and postdocs. So if you're interested in this type of work, I would highly recommend you reach out to Mark and inquire about positions in his lab. And so um, what, what Mark did was to, he was interested in looking at uh, one of the larger populations of cells in the lateral hypothalamic area, this is glutamatergic neurons. So uh, LH has a mixture of GABAergic and glutamatergic cells. And for this study, Mark was really just focusing on the glutamatergic cells. And um, we wanted to see whether or not these cells um, that project to VTA and habenula were uh, distinct from each other. And so what he did was to inject um, retrograde viruses that were cre-inducible into the lateral habenula or the VTA of a VGLUT2 Cre mouse. So what this will do is label um, habenula projecting glutamatergic neurons in green or um, VTA projecting glutamatergic neurons in red. And so um, what Mark found was that um, yes, both of these neurons exist. There's glutamatergic neurons that project to both habenula and VTA. Um, but these are largely distinct from each other. So that's summarized in this pie chart um, that only 7% of the cells were labeled with both of these markers. Most of the cells were uh, labeled with one or the other. And for the uh, habenula cells, you can see here that there's um, some of these cells are in the neighboring endopeduncular region and they sort of bleed into the lateral hypothalamic area. Um, whereas for the VTA projecting cells, they tend to be uh, largely localized within the LH. Another interesting finding that Mark saw from this data um, was that the uh, habenula projecting cells tended to be enriched in the anterior um, lateral hypothalamus, while the VTA projecting cells tended to be enriched in the posterior lateral hypothalamus. And so um, after showing that those cells were distinct from uh, one another, we were interested in using single cell transcriptional profiling to see if we can um, start to look for molecular features that could define these different types of glutamatergic projection neurons. And so uh, what we did was using those same um, um, or uh, different retrograde viruses um, 
but to essentially express fluorophores in these uh, LHA projection neurons to the habenula or VTA. Um, after they are expressed in those cells, we punch the lateral hypothalamus, perform single cell um, uh, RNA sequencing again, uh, delineated a number of different cell types that sort of replicated our previous work, as well as the work of uh, Lauren Mickelson, who published a nice paper on the cell types in the lateral hypothalamus. Um, but now within this data set, we had those fluorescent markers or the genes for those fluorophores that we could use to identify either habenula projecting cells or VTA projecting cells. And so um, that's what we're seeing here. You see the, um, these cells that are color coded in red are the uh, tomato expressing um, VTA projecting cells and the cells that are shown in green over here are the habenula projecting cells. And so uh, what this is beginning to show us is that these cells are not only sort of anatomically distinct from each other, but also they're very molecularly distinct. And uh, just like Stephanie uh, uh, showed in her talk, we saw that these VTA projecting cells um, were highly enriched in the expression of uh, the uh, pre-pro dinorophin, um, as well as orexin hypocretin. Um, whereas the habenula projecting cells, uh, the marker that we identified was the PAX6, uh, which really nicely uh, overlapped with these habenula projecting cells. And so um, now that we've identified these cell types within the single cell transcriptional profiling data, we can start mining through the data to see whether what other molecular markers might be different or are there druggable targets within these different uh, cell types with respect to all the other cells that might be interesting to follow up with functional studies. So, but moving on from the molecular stuff, um, Mark also did a very detailed characterization of the electrophysiological properties of the uh, habenula or VTA projecting glutamatergic neurons. And I'm not showing all the data here. I'm just showing uh, a couple panels from the, one of the figures showing this. Um, but we saw that they were, um, uh, uh, could be uh, under many different uh, sort of electrophysiological assays were distinct from one another. And this is just one example showing that the uh, habenula projecting cells um, show a higher spontaneous and evoked firing rate compared to the VTA projecting cells. And then finally, the last uh, uh, bit of data that I'll share with you from uh, this paper was um, some two-photon imaging experiments where um, we took a VGLUT2 cream mouse and injected uh, using an intersectional uh, viral strategy. We were able to target either the lateral habenula projecting glutamatergic neurons or the VTA projecting glutamatergic neurons. And uh, in the same surgery, we implanted a Grin lens uh, which would allow us to image these. And then of course, I should have mentioned that these cells are all expressing uh, GCAMP in a genetically defined and anatomically defined uh, fashion. And so uh, Mark did a couple different experiments, but I'm just gonna share a few with you here. Um, we wanted to see whether um, given the role of both the lateral hypothalamus, the habenula and VTA in sort of coding, rewarding and aversive stimuli, we wanted to see whether there's any difference between these two different projection populations in terms of their coding of um, uh, randomly delivered appetitive rewards, in this case sucrose, or randomly delivered um, aversive taste in uh, quinine. And so, uh, thanks. Um, and so about 75% of the trials were sucrose, 25 were quinine, just to keep the animals responding. And in both uh, populations of cells, we saw that um, uh, the glutamatergic neurons uh, responded both to um, the sucrose and quinine, but in both of the projections, they tended to respond more robustly to uh, the quinine delivery compared to the sucrose. So it seemed like they were um, um, uh, coding uh, the aversive stimulus more than uh, the um, appetitive stimulus. So um, sort of take home message from that was that there was a lot of similarities between uh, the cells in terms of their encoding properties, just to the sort of basic um, appetitive and aversive stimuli that we were using. Um, but one thing we did find that was different, which is uh, quite interesting and I think deserves um, sort of a paper to follow it up in even more detail, was that um, we looked at the response of these neurons in terms of how satiety signaling hormones can modulate their activity. So within the lateral hypothalamus, um, it's been shown electrophysiologically and through CFOS experiments and such um, that uh, hormones such as leptin or ghrelin that will uh, suppress or enhance feeding or sort of promote hunger 
uh, with the case of ghrelin, um, are uh, likely can be acting on uh, different lateral hypothalamic cell types. And so we wanted to see whether or not just systemic hormonal manipulations that we think will cause uh, robust changes in the satiety state of the animal, would they alter the encoding of these different types of glutamate cells that are projecting to habenular VTA. And um, that's uh, essentially um, what Mark um, found with uh, the leptin actually increased the response of the VTA projecting neurons where we saw um, um, a reduction of the activity in the habenula projecting neurons. And uh, with ghrelin, we saw that ghrelin enhanced the activity of the habenula projecting neurons but didn't impact the VTA projecting neurons. So I think this is really starting to um, you know, set the stage for further uh, studies looking at how uh, hormonal manipulations and hormonal signaling within the lateral hypothalamus may be propagated and conveyed to sort of canonical brain reward circuitry such as VTA and habenula. And so quickly, just to summarize, um, in the Hashikawa et al. paper, we identified 12 molecularly distinct medial and lateral habenula um, cell types. Um, we saw a very high homology in terms of gene expression between mouse and zebrafish using the Pandy et al. data set. Um, we also showed that each, uh, some cell types had unique electrophysiological fe features. Um, it didn't show that data, but if you're interested in it, you can see the paper. Um, and that we can um, map back the anatomical location of the cells using the combination of single cell RNA sequencing and high flex fluorescent in situ hybridization. And then I just showed you uh, the unpublished work from Mark Rossi uh, showing that the lateral habenula and VTA projecting lateral hypothalamic glutamate neurons are anatomically, transcriptionally, electrophysiology, electrophysiologically, and somewhat functionally distinct from each other. And so with that, I would just like to acknowledge again, um, everybody who um, worked on these projects. So um, Yoshiko Hashikawa, who is my lab manager, Koichi Hashikawa, who's a, um, a senior postdoctoral fellow in my lab, uh, were co-first authors on the Abenula paper. And then Mark Rossi, uh, Marcus Basiri, uh, Jill Liu, and Koichi and Yoshiko all contributed to the uh, recent data um, that I just shared with you. And with that, thank you for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Garrett. That was a fascinating talk on a new topic for many of us. Although, as you said, it, it does relate very closely to Stephanie's talk and Dr. Hirokawa's talk. Uh, I think we have time for maybe three questions. Laura, would you take over? Yes, yeah, we have a question from Daniela who asks, um, well, usually it is more difficult to a cell um, to express two viruses at the same time due to spatial constraints. How did you control for that? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, I'm, I'm not 100%. Yeah, uh, I can, let's see maybe if Daniela might perhaps add some more information. Um, uh, well, let's move on. And, uh, Daniela, perhaps you can type in uh, some clarif clarification on that question. So, uh, on to uh, Jose de Jesus Aceves Winnie. Buen dia. Good morning, Jesus. Jose de, de Jesus. Um, Jose asks, is there one of the LHA B, B GLUT2 neurons um, co-releasing GABA in the LH? Um, is the, can, you, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah, so are, I guess I think he's asking, are there um, uh, B GLUT2 neurons co-releasing GABA in the lateral habenula? Lateral habenula sorry. Um, so we did not test for that, but um, there's a couple other studies who have looked at the sort of adjacent endopeduncular uh, cells that project to the lateral habenula, and it, it's very difficult to say whether an individual cell, I think, is co-releasing glutamate and GABA, but if you label like one flavor of those cells or all the lateral habenula projection cell, cells from the, L, from the lateral hypothalamus, you do see uh, co-release or you see uh, detectable optically evoked excitatory currents and inhibitory currents. Um, in our hands, and I think largely from the other papers that have been published, they tend to be more on the excitatory side, meaning you see like larger amplitude EPSCs and you know, smaller amplitude IPSCs. But, um, and then from the gene expression point of view, if you look at the 
genetic markers for glutamate cells and GABAergic cells, there is a small population of the lateral hypothalamic cells that express both VGAT and VGLUT2. And we don't have a good handle on what those cells are doing, whether they're just sort of this weird intermediate phenotype um, that's sort of in the middle of a spectrum between glutamate and GABA, or whether they represent like a bona fide unique cell population. But uh, there's experiments ongoing that will hopefully address that. Good. It looks like Habiba Kashbui expanded on Daniela's question. Yes. Um, Habiba adds uh, saying two viruses affect each other's expression. So I guess Daniela is asking about co-expression of two different vi viruses within the same cell and whether that might um, ha have an effect um, on, on uh, Yeah, I mean, I think it's something always to be mindful of in these types of experiments, whether you're one virus or two virus or whatever. Um, we certainly see that um, not in any of the work that I've talked about today, but in other studies that certain serotypes tend to dominate over the expression of others, even if like the payload and promoters are same and things like that. Um, but as far as I know, there's not really any good logic um, in terms of, you know, having predictions on how that's going to work. So we just tend to take a trial and error approach. And before we move forward with sequencing or two photon imaging, you know, we look at the tissue and try to get a handle on whether or not, um, you know, the two virus strategies are actually going to be viable for targeting uh, cells in an intersectional fashion. And I would say in some cases, like the ones I talked about today, it does work okay, but there's certainly other cases where, you know, you have to go through a lot of different viruses to find a combination uh, that works. And just sort of a point to add along that lines, I think it's good to, uh, you know, be mindful that uh, we are targeting, uh, you know, unique populations of cells, both uh, molecularly and anatomically using these approaches. Um, but there's certainly biases that uh, molecular tools and viruses um, can sort of um, introduce into the experiments. And there's, you know, not a real good way workaround for that, but I think you just need to be thinking about it and um, just, you know, be mindful that you might only be targeting a fraction of the cells that project to a particular region or something like that. Yeah, I think that does, oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just gonna say, I think that does actually address because Daniela also added, it's, it's because um, you say that you only have 7% of co-expression of both viruses. And so she was, I think, concerned that perhaps there might be a bias because of exactly as you just said. So, um, but that, yeah, I think that gets at it. Uh, th there's another question from um, uh, somebody who's anonymous uh, who says, great talk, thanks. Um, they're wondering whether the transcriptional analysis gives you any clues about how leptin and ghrelin are having differential impacts on uh, the different populations of um, lateral hypothalamic neurons. Yeah, that's a great question. Um... We have just begun to look at that. Um, so we've looked at um, the receptor distribution for the ghrelin receptor and the leptin expression, uh, leptin receptor. They'd have to follow up with Mark. I can't remember exactly what the, the details on that was, but certainly, you know, that's a, a very uh, good avenue going forward to continue to look at these things to see whether there's genes associated with leptin receptor signaling, for example, that's expressed in one, but not the other. Um, and doing a lot more sort of uh, uh, fish experiments to confirm uh, cell type specific gene expression. But, um, you know, I think one of the uh, sort of nice things about these data sets is um, it's a lot of information. You can't look at everything, but at least you can put it out there for the community to sort of mine through and look for their favorite genes of interest or follow up experiments that can be done just bioinformatically without any additional wet lab work. Uh, we actually have two more minutes, and so there's one more question more if you'd like to go ahead. Sure. It's quite impressive. We managed to get through them all. It's um, so this is <laughs> one last one from Jose, um, who asks whether it's possible to block the aversive behavior that you found was caused by the activation of the lateral habenian habeni neurons with channel T blocker. Um, I don't think we looked at that. I mean, presumably they're asking if we can you know, stimulate it optogenetically and do some pharmacology to intervene. Um, I would assume that would be the case, but we definitely didn't do that experiment for that particular um, paper. But you know, another interesting idea would be to, um, and I didn't get into the details, but you know, the general sort of consensus is that these habenula inputs are predominantly targeting GABAergic neurons in the VTA RMTG 
that you know sort of locally inhibit dopamine cells. And so you can imagine genetic manipulations in GABA cells that would sort of reduce the excitatory input or impact on those cells might have effects selective over dopamine cells, something like that. Okay, Garrett, thank you very much, Professor.